Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Well, Donald Trump was certainly bold in his promises, even on day one, pledging to eradicate Islamic terror from the face of the earth. He took the threat to ISIS so familiar from that campaign trail right to the heart of Capitol Hill. We will seek friendship and goodwill with the nations of the world, but we do so with the understanding that it is the right of all nations to put their own interests first. We do not seek to impose our way of life on anyone, but rather to let it shine as an example. We will shine for everyone to follow. We will reinforce old alliances and form new ones and unite the civilized world against radical Islamic terrorism which we will eradicate completely from the face of the earth. Mark Urban, our diplomatic editor, joins me here. This was essentially, Mark, then his foreign policy that he laid out today. Absolutely, in five sequential statements. Uh, national interest first, as we've been hearing, uh, protectionism, all the rest of it. Not seek to impose our system on others. Rejection of the George W. Bush doctrine, if you like, in Iraq and elsewhere. But also comforting words for Russia and China there, potentially. Uh, then you've got him saying, reinforce old alliances. Little words of comfort for NATO there, I think, mm. and work to establish new ones. Who knows, maybe with Russia. And then that very strong statement about eradicating militant Islamic terrorism around the world. And we've learnt more today about what he's actually doing now in office. We have uh, some changes on the White House website, mentions of climate change removed, also some important annou announcements for the Department of Defence, uh, the sequester, the sort of pinching of the pipe on their money being removed, that was put there by Republicans mm. essentially anyway uh, to, to hamper President Obama. A lot more money going into defence. New missile defence plans also announced tonight. And just before we came on air, General Mattis confirmed as the Secretary of Defence, one down, 659 <laughs> Trump officials requiring Senate confirmation to go. They yeah. really aren't ready. They may have the ideas. They may have the big, bold Steve Bannon policy platform that we heard on that day us today but they don't have people in place yet to deliver it. It's a long journey ahead, and I don't know whether our viewers can hear, but we can hear the marching bands behind us and the helicopters on sirens. top. The sirens. Give us a sense. You've been on the streets this evening. What's the mood? Well, I mean, the thing I've got to say, listening to that speech, firstly, uh, I mean, obviously, a lot of very ha happy Trump supporters, one of them yelled, we did it, as he finished the oath. But not that enthused, I found, by the content of the speech. Just, yeah, OK, let's get on with it. There are, of course, lots of people on the streets who are also opposed, black bloc, anarchists, other people like that who've been damaging property during the day. The police say around 100 people arrested. So the scale of it is limited, but it has caused quite a sharp change in the atmosphere of the city. Anyway, look, from tomorrow, the question will be really, what is this new administration going to look like? What shape will it take and how will it govern? Out of capitalism's cauldron of success and excess comes a man who his backers say embodies New York. Brash, outspoken, self-proclaimed master of the deal, the president America has chosen to send from this mecca of can-do to the political gridlock of Washington. How will Trump govern? What sort of people has he chosen? And what might we expect from this administration in its first hundred days? Well, central to the answers in all those cases is the business culture of this place and Trump's projection of his image that he's the man who can get the best deal for America as a whole. Yes. To deliver success, 
Trump has turned to people like Texas businessman Sid Miller. On the shortlist for a cabinet job, his contact with the transition team convinced him they were more interested in delivery than ideology. They are really interested in, in uh, uh, looking outside the box, you know, getting business people in there, people that make sound monetary decisions. And, and uh, it's not so much about being a, a conservative, it is being pragmatic. They want people that can identify the problem and fix it. The process of auditioning cabinet picks went on for weeks. Even some who'd been bitterly critical rode the golden lift up Trump Tower for interviews. Was that a sign of broad-mindedness? Not exactly, thinks one never-Trump Republican on an alleged transition team blacklist. One theory is that uh, he actually doesn't care if you oppose him, you know, if you come around. Uh, second theory is that he enjoys humiliating people, and of course most of those visits were done very publicly. A uh, third possibility is that he was actually casting for a reality television show called The United American Presidency. As for Trump's business reputation, is it overblown? In Atlantic City, the Taj Mahal Casino was launched with a characteristic jackpot of Trump hyperbole. He called it the eighth wonder of the world and focused on the glamour, the grandeur. You see a tale of two cities in a lot of ways. You see glamour on the boardwalk in certain sections of town, but if you go to other parts of the city, you see neighborhoods that are ruined. The Taj Mahal closed down a few months ago with the loss of 3,000 jobs. Trump sold out a while back. He's a smart guy. He'll draw the line of where he cares and where he doesn't care. And if he doesn't... In 2005, as part of an attempt to turn things round, he sent Randall Pickett, the winner of his reality show, The Apprentice, to Atlantic City. I believe he left Atlantic City worse than he found it. And that, to me, is another pattern we see with Donald. Look at other properties in Mexico and in, in Florida where He's made promises to others that were not delivered upon. There is a long line of individuals who followed Donald's name, followed Donald's word, and never got what they bargained for from Donald. So what's happened now Trump's chosen cabinet has reached Washington? The questions have come thick and fast in Senate confirmation hearings. Billionaire Betsy DeVos, chosen as Education Secretary, was quizzed about tax returns, ethics committee filings, holdings in companies providing education services, and her basic suitability for the job. You can't say definitively today that guns shouldn't be in schools? Well, I, I will refer back to uh, Senator Enzi and the school that he was talking about in Wapiti, Wyoming. I think probably there, I, I would imagine that there's probably a gun in the school to protect from potential grizzlies. But because Trump has so far sent forward only a fraction of the people required to face scrutiny, Republican senators we spoke to want to push on. In this case, with a nominee who's made substantial campaign donations to 20 of them. She didn't donate to me, so uh, there's, I can say that uh, it certainly is not troubling to me either way. There uh, have been Obama administration officials who have been large donors to Democratic causes. So, um, I certainly don't see that as being disqualified. A lot of the Democrats are really wealthy too. The fact is, are we going to foreclose opportunities to serve in this government because a person has been successful in life? I mean, that's crazy. We ought to be hoping that a lot more of them will come out of the woodwork and, and help us to get this country out of the mess it's in. No sooner have Trump's doer and disruptor nominees stepped into the Washington swamp 
and the political bindweed has begun to wrap itself around their ankles, with questions multiplying about tax returns, shareholdings, possible conflicts of interests, and questions also about just how quickly key Trump policies like the repeal of Obamacare can actually be brought about. All tough challenges when Trump voters expect results. In the corridors of Senate buildings, people have come to lobby for or against Trump nominees. Obviously, he's a different candidate than we've ever seen before, so I think he's going to use that to his advantage. He's going to use change. He's going to make America great again. I can't hear you. This is Washington politics as usual, with its checks and balances. How then, with a trickle of nominees and their hearings slowing down, will Team Trump maintain momentum? The transition is going to be a little rough. Uh, we're going to have to do some things that, that is going to be a little displeasing to get our foothold back on the global stage, uh, especially when it comes to trade. But in the long term, I am really excited for my country. I think this is the most exciting time in my lifetime. I think we have, this president has the potential to be the best president in my lifetime. Some nominees in defense and foreign policy have differed significantly with the new president. But real power resides in the White House. And the way Trump himself behaves will be key. I believe on the things he cares about, his image, his brand, his celebrity, he cares about them passionately and will call, email, tweet, defend himself until 3 o'clock in the morning. But on the things that he doesn't care about, say, the inner details of the country, he may delegate that or assign that to somebody else. He will not change his behavior patterns. He's a 70-year-old man. And so I think there's a good chance we'll get kind of willful dangerous and conceivably illegal behavior. Now, I think the institutions will help contain it. His immediate staff, I believe, will not. I think they'll feed it and foster it. So I'm expecting a series of crises. Few expect the coming weeks to be easy, Trump has sold himself as a disruptor who'll shake this town to its foundations. But he's not the first president to promise radical change, and Washington ground the others down. Mark Urban, Walid Faris, President Trump's advisor on the Middle East during the course of the campaign, joins us now. Very nice uh, to have you here, Walid. Help us make sense of what Donald Trump's policy is now. He talked today of wiping out Islamic terrorism from the face of the earth. What does that mean in terms of his policy for the Middle East? Does he want to join Putin? Uh, it doesn't mean that he's going to be joining Putin in a Yalta and dividing the world that some are concerned about. What he means, basically, is that he is going to be thinking deeper and more strategic way to make sure that we need to have the right coalition with Arab moderates to go after ISIS, to make sure that who replaces ISIS is not an ISIS 2 or Al-Qaeda 3. We're going to make sure that the civil societies that will be liberated from ISIS will be managed by moderates as well. But of course, there will be uh, interactions with President Putin, because if there is an area of uh, coordination between the Russians and Americans on terrorism, that would work. Does he want to take American values to the Middle East? Is that at the core of what he wants? He actually said it today in the speech, and he said in previous speeches, we will show our values, we will show by example, and if these societies want to follow, we'll be very happy. And he gives the example of millions of immigrants want to come here. Why? Because they know our values are there. But he also talked about America having protected too long the borders of others and not its own borders. So if there was the kind of invasion, for example, in Kuwait we saw, do you think America would be riding to the rescue under Donald Trump? He also said that we will not abandon our allies. And he did not just mean Israel. He also means the Arab Gulf. He means also South Korea. He means maybe countries in Eastern Europe if there is a problem. So he will stick with alliances. And he said today, and I quote, we will stick with our alliances and build new alliances based on common values, common grounds. Do you think he is fundamentally, though, a businessman in the role of the president? Is he essentially trying to get whatever the pragmatic business interests for America are first, and foreign policy fits into that sphere? He, you know what? He's, he's formed out of two components. And I had my own experience in meeting with him when he started his uh, career as a candidate, as a politician. 
but he's also a CEO, was a brilliant CEO of a major organization. I think he's going to merge between being a politician, being a CEO, and end up with a new type of presidency in the United States. What does that mean for the old rules of diplomacy? He called Taiwan first. It angered China. Was that a mistake or was he trying to send a message? Actually, it was Taiwan that called him. He accepted the call of Taiwan. And that was, of course, against the policy of the previous administrations. It is a message to China. But he's not. at the same time, while this was happening, guess what? He had advisors in China talking to the Chinese. So what was he trying to do there? Was he trying to send a message to China or was that a mistake? No, he had many cards in hand. He is saying, why do I have to do what China wants before negotiating with the Chinese what we want? Should America's allies be worried, though, about the new America that is surfacing? Because they've seen what he said about NATO in the past. They've seen him say, I'm not going to run to the rescue if Russia invades one of the former uh, Soviet satellite states. What can they expect from America? You know, I spent one whole year as one of its foreign policy advisors during the campaign. And mostly I was talking to diplomats, governments, international media, very concerned about what would be a Trump presidency. And we explained to them that he does not want to dismantle NATO. He want to reorganize NATO. And by the way, many Europeans, well, including the, the Easterners, are very concerned about the huge bureaucracy in Brussels. Second, Europe has been hit by jihadists. It's been 10 years hit by jihadists. So they need to put some resources with us in the Middle East and bring in Arab martyrs. No, I think he's up to a ma major uh, There's a difference, uh, architecture. Though, isn't there? There's a difference between getting rid of bureaucracy. Everyone talks about getting rid of bureaucracy and saying, do you know what? If you get invaded by Putin, sorry, but this isn't our problem anymore. That's where the difference lies now. He, he where made, is he? He made those statements. He did, didn't he make also statements about shutting down immigration from the Muslim countries? He made many of these statements during the campaign. But he spent many months after that to mold these statements into political foreign policy documents that are very important. He does not want to abandon allies, but he wants to sit down with those allies and make sure that this ally alliance is, is working. But that sounds like what you're explaining to us is he says one thing on the campaign and then he kind of understands it a bit better and says something else. Is that how he works? His predecessor, President Obama, said so many things on the campaign trail and he himself, before leaving a few days ago, said we couldn't do everything we said and we have been very much uh, educated by uh, being in government. So that's the experience that Mr. So Trump will go through. So when he says, I'm going to eradicate Islamic terrorism from the face of the earth as his advisor, do you believe him when he says that? Oh, absolutely, that he has the intention of going after the jihadists. What do you think the UK, France, Britain... Of course, Britain, everyone every can have the intention. Do you think he has the capability and the wisdom and the understanding to, to go about foreign policy in a way that you make sense the question I have why not I mean he has shown in his foreign policy speeches that he could put a rational strategic platform my question is will the other partners work with him to erad eradicate jihadism Will the Europeans come together with him and my bigger bigger challenge will we have Arab Alliance working with us because on the ground in reality in the Middle East they would be the ones to help us what do you think we will come to understand by Trumpism in foreign policy terms. What will that signify, do you believe? He has been criticized as either an isolationist or a interventionist. Uh, as a political scientist, I think he's neither one. He is a functionalist. It's in function of the American interest and the interest of our allies. Well, Ed Farris, thank you very much for joining us. Good to have you. Thank you. In his speech, Donald Trump talked about American carnage as well. Not abroad this time, but at home and the crime, and the gangs, and the drugs that have stolen too many lives and robbed our country of so much unrealized potential. This American carnage stops right here and stops right now. So to all Americans in every city near and far, small and large, from mountain to mountain, from ocean to ocean, Hear these words. You will never be ignored again. Your voice, your hopes, and your dreams will define our American destiny. And your courage and goodness and love will forever guide us along the way. Together, we will make America strong again. We will make America wealthy again. We will make America proud again. We will make America safe again. And yes, together, 
We will make America great again. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless America. Thank you. God bless America, and that was the end of the speech. But joining us now, our political panel, Ben Smith, editor-in-chief of BuzzFeed, Politico's Susan Glasser, and the author and journalist, Michael Wall. Thank you all uh, for coming to be with us tonight. And Michael, many people thought they heard echoes of Steve Bannon throughout this speech. Did it have his thumbprint on it? You know him pretty well. I, I think, I think um, I'm looking for a word more than a thumbprint. I think it was, it was Steve Bannon all in. Um, this is what Steve Bannon has been, who joined the campaign in August, and from August on, this this is the point of view that he has been expressing to to me, to anyone who's talked to him, and also to Trump again and again and again and again. This is all Steve Bannon. So, how much of the work, the heavy lifting, Ben? Do you think? that Trump himself will be doing? How would you divide the work that's going on in the presidency? I mean, I think he's going to be president of the United States. I think clearly Bannon's you know, paw prints were all over this one. And, but, you know, but it also echoed his convention speech, which was also, which was, wasn't quite as tight, but which was dark, which was combative, which was about the carnage in America and about a, you know, a nationalist vision. And so I think, and I think, you know, I do think it's also Donald Trump. And I think people who, and I think he's going to be president of the United States and he's going to be, he's going to be the guy making the key decisions. And, and there's a huge amount of uncertainty about remember, what they will be. I was just remembering that, that line from John Kasich when he was originally asked to be the vice president and Trump's son was reported to have said to him, you'll have domestic policy, you'll have home policy. And Kasich said, what's Donald Trump going to do? And the son said, he's going to make America great again. So the question is more, is he going to have his, his read across the whole of the presidency? Or do you think he'll start, you know, metering it out, some to Ivanka, some to Jared, some to the family? I mean, the American government is this incredibly enormous, complex thing that is extremely hard to run and figure out where the levers are. But no, but I think Donald Trump will be president of the United States. He'll be the one making the important decisions. I think, I don't think anybody quite knows what they're going to be yet. Susan, were the Democrats right to stay away today? We understand up to a third of them didn't show up from the House, I'm talking about. And the lone figure of Hillary Clinton, I don't know, probably could have used their support. Well, you know, look, I think the Democrats who counted, the ones who mattered at the top of the party, the leadership, even people who really disagreed uh, not only with Hillary Clinton but also with Donald Trump did show up today. Uh, and, you know, I think that was an important statement. We Americans are very good at, uh, you know, forcing our politicians when they lose into, you know, forms of ritual humiliation. Al Gore, you'll remember, uh, as president of the Senate, had to sit there and oversee the uh, disputed counting uh, of the electoral votes. Uh, so, you know, this is not unprecedented. But certainly, I think it was a powerful spectacle to many Americans today to see Hillary Clinton in her white pantsuit that, uh, you know, one expected she would wear in a very different context showing up today uh, in her capacity, by the way, yeah. not as the defeated uh, presidential candidate, but as the former first lady. There are so many questions now for all of us about how we interpret the narrative of what happens over the next four years. And Bob Woodward, arguably America's greatest investigative journalist, uh, told me yesterday, you've got to be so neutral you can't stand it. It sounded like a thing of pain. So I wonder how you approach this It also now. sounds like he's not neutral. Because what? Because if you say it's, you have to be so neutral that you can't stand it, the point about neutrality is that you can stand it. That's where you want to be. That's where you should be. Ben, did you think you were being neutral when BuzzFeed went ahead and published the dossier that everyone else had chosen not to? I think we're certainly being neutral. I mean, I know people were I think there was a very heated debate on it, including Michael and others. I don't think there's any question we wouldn't have published it if it was about a Democrat. But, but um, yeah, and I, but and I think I think the question of of neutrality I think is going to be an absolute question, and I don't think they would have published it. So you say that with no evidence. I do think one of the interesting questions will be who angles for access and exactly how far people bend over for access to, to you know in any context with any politician look i have to say something here you know we we tend to get into these pretty stale debates over the meaning of objectivity and who's a neutral journalist and partisanship in our politics the thing as journalists that should concern everyone uh, regardless of where your personal preferences lie down is where is the role of journalism and independent reporting anymore in our society? I mean, you know, what concerns me as someone who spent the last two and a half decades as an independent journalist, that doesn't mean I don't have opinions, but I certainly try very hard to cover Republicans and Democrats well, equally. I mean, we're, we're in this campaign, the role of facts 
seem to be overwhelmed by a miasma of misinformation, a flagrant disregard for the kind of reporting that up until now we've fact, all I, I think you know, that anything or any way in which Donald Trump will act, do you think, in terms of how the reporting goes about? Well, I mean, I mean, I think, I think it is. I think one of the things that that Donald Trump does is play exactly to the media, or he plays the media in a way that the media falls into this into this trap every time. Mm -hmm. Effectively, and I have never seen this in all my long years. Um, in this in this business, the media is the opposition. The media is the political resistance. The media, because the Democrats aren't. Well, look, you know, Democrats are famous for their internal divisions. Uh, Republicans have a lot of them too, and and many people have said, Michael, among them, uh, I think very cogently that. It's like there's a third party in Washington today. You know, there's the Trump party, then there's Republicans and Democrats. But the media isn't the political partisan resistance. The media it afflicts those in power. And Ben, I wonder if the media is parties. now becoming this official opposition. There is even more pressure to actually get that, things I mean, right and not just publish stuff that could be completely demonstrated. I think there's always been enormous pressure to get things right. I think questions like how long should the Washington elite and media sit on a secret document that's being fought over at the highest levels are good questions that people can disagree with about. But I think the notion that. But you don't. But, have but any I think regrets. I think the you notion that you absolutely that? not. But I think the notion and that you, you just sort again. of adopt. Yes, and I think the notion that you just sort of adopted as fact. That would you the say media you had regrets become... if you did have, regre have, have regrets? I think I would. I, yes, I would. Um, but I think the notion that, that, the, that the media, as you just seem to adopt, is the political resistance is obviously how Donald Trump is trying to position it, was the theme of his last press conference. I think the media is going to, I mean, and his con main conflicts with the media were when the media said something, when he said something false and the media then reported mm -hmm. it was false. That does not strike me as opposition. That strikes me as doing He's our jobs. He's weaponized this term fake news now, right? I, I mean, well, I think I mean, he has. I, 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 mean, I, think a, I think it's a phony term, and it came in as a term as a term against him, um, and then it was turned around because he's very good at this. But again, that's another example of that where of of I think right where the fight is going to be. It's going to be between Donald Trump and the media, and partly well, because the media is so unpopular, this is going to work for him. We're going to come back. Aren't popular or not? We're, I mean, that's not the issue. Thank you all very much. And we're